Who am I? Where am I going? Where do I belong? Have you ever asked yourself these questions? Wondering where you fit and what you were meant for? We're all born with a desire for purpose, a purpose that extends far beyond ourselves. We long for a place to experience genuine community and an opportunity to make an impact in others' lives. And so we run, we run hard, trusting that our feet will sustain us, giving all that we are and have to be accepted, seen, and loved, bearing with one another on this journey we call life. Because deep down, we know we're made for more, made to worship, blessed to give, and we're called to care for others and share the love that's freely given to us. Because we can go further, faster, when we're together on mission. Okay, let me ask this. How many parents out here, give me a hand raise, come on. Parents in the room, parents, and those in the room and those online, go ahead and raise your hand at home. Lots of parents, has this ever happened to you? You were someplace with your child and then they were gone. Thank you for identifying with me. Jody and I were at an amusement park, the whole family is there, all of a sudden, our blonde-haired, blue-eyed youngest is not there. And I'm thinking to, that Jody has her, and Jody's thinking that I have her, and nobody has her. So I go crazy like a chicken with his head cut off, and I'm running around the park trying to find her. And then I'm like, I got to go to the front of the park. I, what if somebody abducted her? I watch way too much 2020 and Dateline. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, what, what, if, what would she look like with brown hair? What if they cut her hair in the bathroom? I'm freaking out. I, I wish I was joking. And so Jody, cool, calm, and collective, she goes over to the kids' play area where all the kiddie rides are, and, and they actually have a security station there and it says it's for, this is what it said, lost parents. <laughs> Jody's talking to the security person. There's this big picture window looking into the kitty area with the coasters and all that. And guess who walks by eating an ice cream cone? <laughs> you guessed it. Emily just walking by like nothing wrong. Jody runs out there. And, what do what you do? What happened? What, where'd you go? And, she looks like, what are you talking about? I'm just going to ride the kitty coaster. She goes, where were you guys? <laughs> Isn't it true, spiritually speaking, that sometimes we're lost and we don't even know it? Sometimes, spiritually speaking, we're lost and we don't admit it. Sometimes, spiritually speaking, other people, people are trying to help us and, and we don't think we need help. That's what I want to talk to you about. Open your Bibles to John chapter nine. We're in a series. It's the conclusion, final, good stuff, good series. It's called Together on Mission. And so what we've been doing, if you're new and joining us online, please, we're looking at characters, individuals in the New Testament who fulfilled the mission of the church by living out the values of this church. These are our values. These are the things we're living out because we want to fulfill the mission of the church. And they're biblical. They're all right here. Today, I'm telling you, John chapter 9, I say this way too much. It's, it's probably my favorite chapter in the New Testament. People are like, you say that every week. Because my favorite chapter is probably the last one that I read. But I'm not kidding. This guy, man. We're going to look at a guy, and I want to give you some characteristics of people who've been found to find. That's the value. So he was found, and then immediately he goes out to find. And so that's what I'm asking of us. So those who've been found, this is a message that's going to press you to go find. For some, it's going to be a little uncomfortable. You're like back and I don't know. And for others who have been found and are finding, 
I, I hope you're going to be encouraged, but our church needs to grow in this value, especially in this season. And so maybe you're here and you're wondering, what can Jesus do for me? I'm not going to rebuke you for that. Wait till you see what he did for this guy. If you're on the fence, wait and see. Verse 1 of John chapter 9, it says this, And he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. Who can guess who the he is here? <laughs> it's Jesus. I mean, capitalize it here. It's, and his disciples asked him, so we got this little sidebar going on, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now they're doing that because they used to tie every sin to a specific action. Sometimes we parents do that. And we got to recognize that our children are born sinners into a world that's filled with sin. The world's off kilter because of sin. Can I get an amen? amen. And, and so what happens is, is it's not all about attaching everything, whether it was the tornado or the earthquake, to some specific thing that one person did. No, it's, our world is, it's off because of sin, Genesis chapter three. But then look what Jesus does. So this is a sidebar. Jesus answered, it wasn't this man's sin or his parents' sin, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So the difficulty, the circumstances, the results of sin are always an opportunity for us to glorify God. That situation, that circumstance, that difficulty, it can be used for God's glory. Again, sidebar, main part of the text. Look what Jesus says. We must work the works of him who sent me. That's what Jesus is saying of God while it is day. Night's coming when no one will work. He wasn't talking about just that night. He's talking about his life. As long as I'm in the world, there it is. I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground. He made mud with his saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So this guy went, he washed, and he came back saying, there's the miracle. Close your Bibles. Let's go home. I mean, it's miraculous. But no, don't leave. Ushers are locking the doors. There's so much more about this guy. And so that's what I want to dig into. The first characteristic is we walk through the text. If you're here in the room and new, we like studying the Bible. And so you could have came up with this message yourself. If you're at home watching, great. We'd love to have you here. Awesome. But I know many people are traveling, but this is a message you could write yourself. First characteristic of people who are found to find is they share their story with boldness. And so that's what we see this guy doing. So that's the next part is he's just going to buck. Man, he's going after it. And the first group of people that come up to him are people that knew him. And so they knew about him, but they can't recognize him. So there's this little argument going on. And the neighbors in verse 8, those who had seen him before as a beggar, were saying, is, is this him? He, he used to sit and beg. And some said, yeah. And others said, no, it can't be him. And look what he says. Look at how bold. No, I'm the man. Hey, hey, don't miss this. I am the person. Look at him. I couldn't see, but now I do. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And, and then look, he explains, he tells his story just like I want you to tell your story of what God has done in your life. That's the backswing thought of the message. That's what we want to learn from this guy. Look how he tells it. So they said to him, how were your eyes open? And he said, well, this man called Jesus. He made mud, he anointed my eyes, and he said, go and wash. And then look at the obedience, end of verse 11. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. And they said to him, who is he? He said, I don't know. I mean, this is amazing. Now, question, put your thinking caps on. What was with the whole mud thing and putting it on his eyes? I mean, couldn't have Jesus just heal them and? He could have done that, right? I mean, was there something in the mud? I mean, of course not. But why didn't he? Very important for us to understand. 
He didn't do it because he wanted this guy to respond in faith. He wanted him to step out in faith and obedience to what he said. And just like he wants us to step out in faith and obedience to what he says. And then blessing follows. See, in the Bible, let me cut to the chase. If you've been to our church for a long time, you'll know this. We've taught on this before. But spiritual blindness and physical blindness is what's encompassed here. So every time in the New Testament, when you see somebody physically blind and Jesus healing him, it's a message to us that we need to be spiritually healed because we're spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says that the enemy of this world, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that we can't see the light of the gospel. So when you go to work, not tomorrow, I was going to say tomorrow. Nobody goes to work anymore. They just sit in their club. When you watch somebody on your screen or you go to a restaurant today, are you compelled with how many people actually cannot see spiritually? Our world is filled with people who, who can't see. Maybe it's in your family. But that's the picture. It's a picture of salvation that this guy, what? The scales fell off. We saw that in this series already with the Apostle Paul. It's a picture for us that the scales must come off, that, that wow, I was doing this, I was in this mess, and now I see differently. I used to be so selfish and demanding, and now I'm seeing things clearly. But that's what the gospel does. I, I was so sinful and self-serving but the blinders have come off and now I see. Doesn't mean I always do it right, but I see differently. That that's, do we get that? I love this. This guy's 15 minutes in the Lord and he's sharing with boldness. Some of us have been 15 years in the Lord and we're backing off. But the scripture says the righteous are as bold as a lion. And so what is this boldness? Let me clarify, boldness is not, boldness is not some red-faced pe preacher, you know, pounding his fist on the pulpit. But boldness is not even, I'll go so far as seeing the guy on Michigan Avenue with the sign that says repent and the microphone, that, that's not all what boldness is. Hey, I would even say that boldness, and hear my heart in this because you know where I'm at. Boldness, it's, it's not picketing the abortion clinic and preventing someone from getting it. That's not everything about boldness. Well, what is it? Well, it, it's what this guy did. Boldness is a spirit-led conviction and enablement that I must share who Jesus is, what he's done, and what he wants to do in you. That's boldness. And here we see this guy. We've been teaching this definition since we started our church back in high school. Boldness. It's spirit-led. That means it's not of you. It's from God. It's a conviction. Man, there's just something in my heart. I, I got to share what God has done. It's an enablement, meaning you can't do it yourself. Hey, God's done something to me. I see. God wants to do it in you. He wants you to see. And... And it's all because of who Jesus is and what he's done. That's the picture. That's John chapter 9. Well, I, what if I step up and I strike out? That's such a fear that prevents many people. You know, It's like I got my tail between my legs. I can't say it. I, I don't know what to say. What, what if I don't know what to say? It's legit. Been there. Write down Matthew 10, 20. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks through you. Bam. He's going to give you the words. Have you ever had that situation when you're just talking and somebody asks you a question and spiritually speaking, you give some answer, you're like, whoa, that was out of body. That, that's Matthew chapter 10, verse 20. Like God gives you the words. I have that experience every day. 
excuse me, every Sunday, four services. Whoa, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> that was actually pretty good at times. God speaks through you. I remember um, the first time that I shared um, my story. It's probably one of the first times. And, and I had just become a Christian, and I was living in Chicago. I got in my car. I drove 400 miles to Cleveland because I wanted to share with my family. My parents, my mom and dad, thought I was crazy. Anybody got that situation? <laughs> They thought I was nuts. There was nothing happening there. So I was all dejected and I was bumming. So I went over to my sister's house, cut to the chase. I, I shared my story with her. She identified with it. She told me things about her and her story that I never knew. She became a Christian that night. And then I drove home and I was going up uh, Route 6 in, uh, in Cleveland and there was a deer, I never tell this part, I don't know why I'm telling it now. There was a deer that came up, I was driving my 1986 Honda Accord with the flip up lights, ooh, very cool. Light blue, very cool. Can't fit in it though, six foot five. Um, but could afford it, back then. Um, and this deer just, just hit me like these, like the lights were no more. <laughs> it was worth it, man. I'd have paid anything. I don't went through anything, any price to be there. I don't care about the car. I don't care about this. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what's all up. Why are we so confused and so concerned about material things and this and that? Man, the kingdom of God can be won through our story. Amen. 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 If, we, if we do it with boldness. Second is this, that people who, who are found to find, they share their story with transparency. And so again, here in the room, you, you, you can see it. That that's what happens next. So, I mean, it's almost comical. It, what happens next is they brought to the Pharisees, we'll put the verses up on the screen. They, they said, this man's not for God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. So they bring him to the Pharisees, and and so the Pharisees are more concerned, let me understand this, they're more concerned about when it happened versus what happened. Is that messed up? They're more concerned when it happened on a Sabbath, you can't heal people because we got all these laws and this tradition that says you can't work. And, and so it's not what you did, it's, it's when you did it that's the problem. Anybody see anything wrong with that? And, and then... He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, how, much can, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. Stop right there. There's always going to be division when it comes to Jesus. I'm sorry, but there is. And, and look, some people said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? So some people are ready to hear some things. Other people aren't. And then I love this openness and transparency. I don't really know. He already said that already. I don't know much about this guy. All I know is a prophet. Do you see the genuineness? See, what we're seeing in John chapter 9 is you are getting a front row seat to someone's conversion story. And we don't think we can share our story because we didn't go to seminary or we didn't have that class or we didn't finish that or we don't, we don't have this certificate. There's no class. There's no certificate. That this guy's just, he's telling what God did, man. He's sharing who Jesus is, what he's done, and what he wants to do in them. He, he's so bold and transparent. That, that, that's why I love it. Even in the face of opposition. He's maybe 45 minutes in the Lord. And he's showed, shared his story with his friends who walked by him and didn't recognize him, and the religious leaders who are ready to kill Jesus. I don't know about you, but this is a guy that I want to be like. <laughs> he didn't really know. I remember when um, I, I, we were living in Arlington Heights at the time, and I was, a, I was kind of a, yeah, I was a pretty new believer, and you know, we had just embraced Jesus in our late 20s, and, and so I was in the business world, and it was a Saturday, I was just sitting at home, and, and these two guys came to the door. Maybe you know these guys. They, wear, they got white shirts, 
black ties. One of them's really old, bearded. The other one's really young. Do you know these guys? They're all over the place. <laughs> and, and so I, normally, this is just true confessions. I'd have been like, looking at, the, no, I'm just not answering it. But there was something inside. I'm like, I, I, I got to answer this. And so I opened the door, and I'm standing there, and you got the older guy, you got the young guy, and I could tell it was the young guy's turn, and he was trying, and, and then the old guy stepped in. And I'm just saying, I didn't know much. I was really nervous. I knew nothing. I just knew my own story. And so I could sense, even there, the discernment that they didn't necessarily believe the same thing about Jesus that I believe. I could, I, it just wasn't coming together. Anybody been in that place? And, and so he's pressing into me, this old guy, and I'm just like this. And, and then finally I just said, well, I don't know what you guys believe. I don't know, all I know is Jesus Christ is God. He's my Lord and Savior, and he saved me, and I'm going to spend eternity with him. And I slammed the door in their face. It's a true story. <laughs> but my heart wasn't clapping because I, like, I was like, what did I just do? And so literally, I went upstairs to my bedroom and I, I don't do this, I repeat. Don't do this. I picked up the Bible and again, I didn't know much about it. And so I did the Russian roulette. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I stopped at what I thought at the time was to John. <laughs> Most of you would say second. <laughs> That's where I was. <laughs> and my eyes went down to verse, I, I kid you not, verse 10 and 11, where it says, and I quote, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house, do not give him a greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked deeds. <laughs> I wish I was joking. <laughs> but God protects us when we step forward with him. Let's share a story with boldness even though we don't know everything, let's share our story with transparency, even in the face of opposition. And, and let's share our story, this is the next thing, with clarity. And this is a pet peeve of mine. I, I think that we make the gospel too complicated. Anybody agree with me? Like our secret, you know, handshakes. And, and our, our Christian jargon. Nobody understands you, justification, sanctification. Like, like nobody knows what you're talking about. It, like we don't, they don't know. I mean, he's not using any language like that. He's in process, man. And, and so this is, it's, it, it can't get more comical than this. So the religious leaders decide to pull his parents in. And you can read for yourself through verses right before 24 or 25 that the parents are like, well, they're so afraid, it says right in the text, that they're like, I don't know, man, you got to ask him. He's of age, like to get away from us. And so look at verse 24 and 25. Whoa, that's an interesting sight. <laughs> Grateful that I have an iPhone. Ooh, good that I have the Bible. And verse 24 and 25 says, and I'm texting the people who can fix this. I'm just kidding. I got to unlock the phone. Um, so verse 24 and 5 says, it's on the other page. So for the second time, they called the man in who had been born. They said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. I mean, he reduced. That's the Lord. Let's praise God for the miraculous. It's all good. You know what? They just did that on purpose to mess with me. And so, so but don't, don't miss this. I 
was blind, now I see. Six words. He brought such clarity to this story that he reduced it in six words. That's every single person who has ever come to Christ. That's your personal testimony. I was blind, now I see. That, that's it? Like, like, it's such clarity. And, and so my challenge to us is, can you share your story in not six paragraphs, how about six sentences? I was blind, and then I know what's happened. I just happened to you guys. Oh, I can't tell my story. It's gonna take a whole hour. <laughs> if you had an hour. All due respect, I love you enough to tell you that nobody wants to listen to you for an hour. <laughs> Isn't it true? Yeah. Not a non-believer. I mean, they're, they're, you, like, we gotta cut, guys, we need a three-minute version, we need a 20-minute version, and we need a 10-minute version. Because you gotta do it right then. And, 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 you know, I, I remember being in the locker room, way too much information now. And it's just like, you know, the guys all know that I'm the pastor and they're, you know, it, it, well, see what, Ron, see what the religious guy thinks over here. And, and, well, what do you think, Mr. Pastor? And am I going to sit down for 45 minutes and open the Bible? No, because I, I practiced it. I thought about what would I say if I was confronted and, and just, I, I practiced and, and I got my chance and, and I just said, hey guys, you know what? You guys all know that, yep, I had a spiritual awakening. Yep, I did. I, you know, you're right. But if anybody ever wants to talk about it, I'll buy a cup of coffee. That was it. I read the room. See, we have this guilt trip. You guys have this guilt. We all want to share the faith. We want to share our faith, but we feel like we don't know how. We feel like we got to deliver the whole thing. We, we, we feel the guilt. Get the guilt on them. That, that's what I did. Hey, if you're interested, I'm always willing to talk. Guess what happened six months later? A crisis in this guy's life. Who did he call? Who did I go out to breakfast with? Who became a Christian? Bill did. The guy who was there. I'm just saying, be able to craft your story in a succinct way that is compelling to grab people's attention and read the situation because some hearts are really hard like the Pharisees in the story. And, and, and the Bible says, don't throw your pearls before swine. And, and other, store, other people are really soft like my friend Bill. So really quickly, we, we've done this before, but this happens in the baptism tank. There's actually a baptism tank over here, and when we do baptisms, these are the three questions that everybody needs to answer. Um, I think that's coming next. Can we put that up? Three questions to share your story. So can you do it? Can you do it? Can you do it? Not the hour version. This helps you to get to the three-minute version. So first question is, what was my life like before Christ? Think about that. How did you feel? Describe it in a couple words. What words would you choose? I mean, just, how did you feel? That's what you gotta tell people. And, and please, it, it, some of you are like, well, you know, I became a Christian at a really young age, and, and so I don't really have a good story. Don't ever say that to me. I will punch you in the stomach. <laughs> because that'll be a good story that you can tell sometime. My pastor punched me. I, I don't know what to do. I hurt, and then he said, God forgives me. And No, no, I mean, listen, please, like, don't shortchange the grace of God, man. And because you were born into a home where somebody knew Christ and the spiritual heritage from those who don't have it, like, like your thing is awesome. And see, God saves people through some things who's been there some bad things some things that you know I was doing this I was doing that and, and God saves people from some things and that's what I hope my story is for my own kids but God always saves us for some things 
He saves us from some things. He saves us through some things. He saves us for, it's all about the grace. And, and so don't, ch- and then another thing. Oh gosh, do I have time for this? I gotta be in Wheaton at like 10.30, so they'll be okay, you're right. What the heck with those people? Okay. I can share my story in seven words with them. I'm just kidding. Don't, I know what you mean. Don't say, I've always been a Christian. You make evangelists like me just want to strangle you. Because you've not always been a Christian. You didn't come out of the womb a Christian. Because Jesus said you must be born again. Now, I know what you mean, and you, you can't remember, and that's okay. But you did make a decision, error on the side of when it became real for you. Talk about that. When I was in college, like, like don't say it. It just confuses people because I'm going for a decision, and that's the next question. What, what was, when did I make a decision for Christ? When did I meet Jesus? And so we all need to, to, to be able to verbalize that. Now, some people, like me, I could tell you where I was. I could, tell you, I could take you to where I was standing and tell you the exact time and date. But not everybody's like that. Like some people, it was a period of years or a circumstance. So, so what was it? Again, describe it in language. Man, I felt this. I, this is what was going on. I, I lost my... my my dad died and I was thinking about eternity and like just tell the story. And, and then the third question is, this is the one that's great, it's just like what, what, what's my life like now that I know Jesus? So, so again, can you answer those three questions really quickly? What was my life like before I met, it, it stunk. When did I meet Jesus? In the lowest part of my life with the stupidest decision that I've ever made. Well, what's my life like now that I just, it's, it's awesome. I, I did it in what, five, six words? C- could you do it? The three minute version? The, the 10 minute version? The, the 30 minute for those who want more? Like, I'm just saying, I'm just pleading with us as a church family, this value, we got to get better at it, man, because we got a lost world that, that is, is, we're, is we're looking at. And God has given you a story for his glory. And we practice all kinds of other things. We draft our football players for our fantasy league, and we do all this. And can you please spend some time rehearsing your story? Man, what a great thing. Just walk out of church right now, get a cup of coffee, and just tell you, hey, let me tell you my story. And in three minutes. We got to do it with clarity. Two more. People are found to find they share their testimony, their story with intentionality. It it, it, it just can't get any better, the story, but it does. So so look what happens next. So they said to him, the, the religious leaders Like, this is the second time he's going to tell the story to them. He's already told it once to his friends. Third time in an hour and 45 minutes, he's telling his story. And what did he do? How did he open your eyes? He's like, I've told you already, and you would not listen. And then, why do you want to hear it again? Do you see the willingness for him to tell his story? And then he says, do you also want to become his disciples? I just love that. That's my favorite part. Hey, do you want to be a Christian? I mean, that's intentionality. Okay, um, let's let's just do a little fun exercise. Don't be embarrassed. I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not going to poke fun at you. I used to be a salesman. How many salespeople do we have in the room? Just go ahead. We got a lot. Yep, some people, big wigs over here. Um, Who who else? Okay, at home even, please raise your hand. Yeah, we can see you. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, Okay, we got a lot of people. Now, you know something. Don't be prideful. But you know, did you raise your hand? Okay, well, you don't know this. <laughs> this, salespeople know this, and Christians are awful at it. It's called close the deal. 
It's, it's called get the contract. It's called sign on the bottom line. See, salespeople ask for the order. They, you ha- if they don't, especially if you're on 100% commission, you ain't eating, man. Ask for the order. We Christians, we don't ask for the order. Put the verse back on. He, he's asking for the order. Do you want to become his disciples? We got to learn, guys. This is the biggest thing. You can share your story and discern where people at. And, and then do this. Let me teach you how to do it as a believer. It's really easy. I remember the first time I did it, I was nervous, but I, I had this sentence, so write this sentence down. Do you want to make a decision to follow Jesus right now? I mean, that's not hard. Do, do you want to make a decision to follow Christ right now? Just like I did when I was a little kid. Just like when I was 27 years old. Do do you want to make that decision? And then see, the reason we don't ask it is because we're afraid that we're not going to be able to answer what comes next. Truth being talked here? True? Truthful? And and so let me teach you the next thing. So two things to write down for the whole message. Write it in your Bibles. Do you want to become a Christian right now? Only two things are going to happen. No, I don't. Yes, I do. Yes is awesome. Can you lead them? No, I don't is rare. I'm telling you, I've done it a lot. A lot of times what you'll get is a blank stare and silence. So, so what you do is simply, this is the second question. What's preventing you from making that decision right now? Sales training really helped me. Do you see that? What, what's the obstacle? And then just, it's just great conversation, man. And you just step back for a moment, man. Don't press them. Don't be like that used car salesman making them, you know, holding them hostage for six hours. I hate buying a car. So I steal them. <laughs> just kidding. Just joking. That just came to me. The Lord's really blessing that. <laughs> I was thinking about that tall thing that you drive by on the highway and they got the cars in there. Like, how do you get in there? I'd like to get one of those. Okay, so seriously, let's pull this in. What's preventing you? And, and honestly, that, like, that's going to lead some great conversation. And maybe you might just say, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know if I have the answer. Let's stop pushing so hard. Hey, I'll get back to you on that. that that's what we need to do. Now, let me show you this real quick. We've showed this before. I'm going to put it on the screen. It's going to come quick. Maybe take a picture of it if we can put it on the big screen. Oh, it's in the middle. So this is the stages of believing, belonging, becoming like Christ. There's 16 steps. I'm showing you this because it doesn't happen right away. Some people know awareness of God, step one. Step two, some awareness of God. Step three, contact with Christians. Step four, interest in Jesus. Investigating Jesus. Understand the implications, step seven. Look at, accept implications of becoming a Christian. Now, this is a long time. Step 10, decision to surrender to Jesus. And then look, experience life change, step 12. Learn the basics of the faith. Learn the disciplines. 15 is share your story with others. 16, ongoing growth. Now, it just takes time. Now, let's just have some fun. Let's put this blind guy who now can see, what, what, where's he at in this story? This guy's all over the place. He's, got, he's investigating Jesus. He doesn't even know who he is. He made a decision to surrender to Jesus, and he's number 15, sharing with others. How about the Pharisees? Well, they have some awareness of God, they're having their first contact with a Christian. Are they interested in Jesus? No, they're not. See, this just helps us scale back the amount of pressure and, and, and what we're going to do and how we're going to share. And what, what about you? Like just in all candidness, where, where would you put yourself on the scale? And I say that with all sincerity because we got a lot of people that are investigating Jesus. And, and if that's you, I, I'm just telling you, uh, there's no way I'm done. Just warning you. 
you're like up way early and just have some fun up there, check your social media, whatever you wanna do. Um, okay, so, so where are you? Seriously, where, where are you? And, and, and if you're, you're investigating, this is a place, we, man, you're welcome here. And, 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 and so I'm just like, have you made the decision to follow him? And, and if so, then let's, let's learn the disciplines. Let's share with others. That, that's what our church is about. So I'm kidding. We're going to wrap this up now. I'm uh, third and sliding into home pretty soon here. The last thing is this. Share your story with urgency. And our time is gone. But I love the urgency, and I'm going to flip it. The urgency is of Jesus. And so look at Jesus' urgency, just like I would want us to be urgent with people who are on the scale interested. And look what Jesus does, man. I mean, it's unbelievable. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they cast him out because he loves us and he wants to protect us. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Look, Jesus, is, 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 he wants to make it clear. He answered, who is he that I may believe in? Jesus is like, it's me, man. You've seen him. He is, he's speaking to you. And then look what it says. He says, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to have the worship team come forward. And in a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to worship him, just like this guy did. And, and, and do you think that's the last time this guy shared his story? Anybody? No way. And, and, and here, I mean, we're seeing two hours of his life, and he shared it three times before we worship and have an opportunity to close the service. And I want us to be united in this value found to find. We're introducing something new. It's called our Prayer, Care, Share Challenge. We've used words and verbiage like this before, but we want you as a follower of Christ to be able to pray, have a list of people you're praying for. Would you do that? John chapter 6, verse 44 Jesus says that the Father has to draw them. That's what the Bible says. And so we've got to pray for the people in our life that we want to share our story with. And so we're going to pray for people. Do you have a list of people that you pray for regularly? And then care. It's like we see Jesus modeling it right here. Jesus is caring for this guy that he healed him. Now, you may not be able to heal someone. If you can, please come up and talk to me. But, but we can all have a tangible way where we care for the needs of others. So who are you caring for in this next season? And then lastly, we, we got to do better, guys. I'm just going to say, everybody up for some honest communication in church? Which value are we doing good at? Hey, we're doing great. Mature to multiply. We've got awesome stuff. This one isn't so great. We've been found, but we don't want to find other people. And, and you've been given a story, and you've seen how easy it is. And so we got a series, who are you sharing with? Your story, who are you sharing with about your church? we got a series we're going to open up to Revelation chapter 2 and 3 next week. So we're studying the book of Revelation. <laughs> it's going to be great. But interestingly, Revelation means to reveal. And most people think it's about revealing the catastrophe and the chaos of the end. Do you know what Revelation is about? It's about revealing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the book of Revelation. And that's what we have an opportunity to share. Maybe you've got a friend or somebody you know, and, and you know what? They've been hurt by the church. Well, we're going to call this open letters, and we're going to say the church stinks. And we're all growing. And what a great opportunity to invite a friend for this series, that we would pray We'd be in prayer for them, we'd be caring for them, we'd be sharing with them. Who's up for it? Give me a hand, Bryce. Let's do it, man. Let's praise the God. Let's use him. Father, use us in this season. Use this story to compel us. Just like this guy worshiped you. May we worship you now for who you are and what you've done as a church. I ask in Jesus' name.